Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. 2 Timothy chapter 1, it's on the right-hand side, and it's going to be powerful tonight. Oh my goodness, I'm excited about it. The title of my speech would be, Turn Your Power On. A couple years ago, I did a commercial, created a commercial for Viacom, and we did it in 100 different countries, and we created a whole campaign around MMA world, and we partnered with a bunch of different organizations. And I remember one night we did a thing, I think it was on um, Spike TV and some other uh, networks where we did an interview. And we were talking about helping people turn their power on and recapture the life that they were meant to live. Because we found so many people were living life by default rather than by design. And tonight I want to piggyback on that. It touched people to a degree, but tonight's going to be really, really good where you get to help you turn your power back on. Because I believe powerlessness is the root of all negative emotion. Let me say that again. Powerlessness is the root of all negative emotion. If you feel powerless to change your past, you feel guilty, condemned, shameful. How many of that's true? Anybody ever been there before? And if you sit there and meditate that I can't change my past, it starts to erode your confidence level and that condemnation starts to steal your joy, which steals your strength. It's quick to know that when the enemy wants to destroy your strength, he always comes with accusatory thoughts of what you're not, what you didn't do, how you haven't done it in the past. But thank God it's not based on your performance that you have approval from God. It's based on Jesus' performance. Performance. Give the Lord a clap and a shout for that. If you feel powerless to change your future, you feel scared. You feel nervous. If you feel powerless, though, to change your present, that can make you angry and depressed. Anybody ever felt that way before? You're sitting there going, I mean, I can't change this. I can't change this. This freaking sucks. I can't change this. I can't change this. And when you start to go down that path, it makes you feel internally angry. And if we're not careful, that sense of powerless, it leads you into a place where all these negative emotions start to drive your life. The Bible says we're to walk by faith, not by sight. In other words, we're not to walk by our senses or our feelings. That's why you'll hear me over and over say this because I say it to myself. You're never what you feel. You're always what you decide. You can feel horny. That doesn't mean you got to go sleep with somebody. You can feel like getting drunk. That don't mean you got to get drunk. You can feel like cheating on your taxes. That doesn't mean you can still hold to your integrity. Come on, somebody. You can feel like living in fear, but that don't mean you have to because you're not what you feel. You're what you decide. I can feel a lot of things that can free you a little bit in here because if you don't have dominion over what you choose and over what you feel, how are you going to cast the demon out? People want power to cast out the devil. You don't got power over a chocolate chip cookie that sits in the freaking front of your face. Just call it like I see it. Brother, give me the double dose. I want to cast out deafness. Well, yo, you can't even stop from eating four chocolate chip cookies at night. How are you going to cast out the devil if you don't got no self-control? Hey, come on, smile. This is going to be good. You're going to like this. It doesn't matter what background you come from. When you feel like you can't change your allergies, your weight, your economy... You're waiting on things to change around you to determine how good your life becomes. You can become internally angry where you feel like, man, maybe I should just resign myself to, man, maybe I should not try anymore. And that's where America is right now. That's where the world is. They're watching leaders. They're watching people manipulate economies, manipulate medical things, all to put you in a place of fear where you feel like you have no control. Proverbs 12, 25 says this, anxiety in the mind causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. When do you feel anxious is when you're trying to control something and you don't have the power to. And it can make you feel like, man, I'm powerless. But the Bible says, and I'm going to get here in a minute, that God gives you a spirit of power. 
You're not going to get it when somebody prays for you. If you are in Christ, if you've over, opened the door, John 1, 12, as many as received him, he gave them power to become a child of God. Anybody in here has received him. That means you got power. Touch the person next to you say, you got some freaking power. You got juice in you. You may not be aware of it. You might have a power outage. Your own choices can make you have a power outage. You could hang out with the wrong people. You could go to relax in the wrong place and they can steal your power. Ask Samson. He went and slept with Delilah. That's not what stole his power. He put his head in her lap. Delilah means rest. He wanted to rest in a place that would compromise him. He was looking for satisfaction and it cut his strength. David in Psalm 27 says he was battling fears. Fears had taken his power. He had a power outage. But all of a sudden, their power was restored. See, when you have a power outage, you can run to a refuge or you can run to the refuge. You have choices tonight. Well, I feel powerless against this feeling. I feel powerless against this addiction. I feel powerless financially. I feel powerless emotionally. My relationship's full of conflict, not creation. I'm in a home where there's a lot of strife. I feel powerless. But what if tonight there could be a restoration of power? I love that scripture where it says there was a man with a withered hand. All the power had been taken from his arm. And Jesus called the man out in the middle of church. It made the religious people bothered and angry. Sometimes you know you're on the right track. If everyone talks well of you, you're doing something wrong. If you go to a church where everybody amens you, you probably don't got an anointing to break the devil off their life. If everybody talks wrong with you, you probably got to look in the mirror and make some changes. <laughs> Come on, don't be deceived. Come on, denial is a river in Egypt. Come on, don't let it be a mindset that you live in. Denial is how you live stuck. Come on, this is going to be good. Jesus approached that man. He said, rise, stand up, stretch out your hand. And the man had no power, but as he moved in a moment, he moved in a moment. See, there's a time for every purpose under heaven. There's a time for this tonight. There's a moment tonight where there's going to be a break in what opposes you. Don't sit there and wait for God to do something that he's going to give you an opportunity to step through. Every miracle, Jesus puts somebody into an active state. Couple, I've never told this story here ever in my life, but Ben, you were with me. I was in LA, about 800 people in the middle of my message and I'm walking back and I was like way, way back towards the end. And I see this guy and he's highlighted to me. I look at him and I, he was highlighted. And I felt the Holy Spirit go, tell that man to run. <laughs> okay, I'm not in TD Jakes's church. Come on, somebody. <laughs> come on, I, I wasn't like, come on, like in a charismatic, you know, hallelujah type of church. So I went to this man in summer. I ran up to this man. I go, run. People are like, get that guy some therapy, some medication. The guy looks at me and I go, stand up and run. I don't know why I told that guy to run. He stands up. People start cheering. He's gathering himself and he takes off running. He's doing laps around the church. Come on. They're cheering for him. I don't know like if they think this guy's a runner or whatever. I found out the man had not been able to run in 22 years and he had not been able to hardly walk. But in a moment, in a meeting, all of a sudden God removed the limitation. He stepped through. Oh, this is going to be good. Oh, stay on target, Rex. Stay on target. Got 28 great minutes here. Come on. Of your life. This is your awesome life. Come on. It's not going to be a shoulda, woulda, coulda story. In one minute, the power was restored to a man's legs that had no idea. There was no, there was no physical evidence that when he came in, he came in a walker. But all of it needed was a word that he could run. When God speaks a word, when you got a word from God, one word is enough. It doesn't matter what it looks like, what it thinks like. Elijah had a word that he prayed and it would rain. There was absolute famine all around him financially, and there was political upheaval, but God said it would rain when he opened up his mouth. That's a word for some of you. You're waiting for a preacher to open his mouth. You're waiting for somebody else to open their mouth in your family. You need to be the one that opens your mouth over your children and says, you're going to be mighty in the land. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. When you got a word from God, 
Elijah had a word. He said, I want to see this word. He kept praying till the word had a, had a physical. He says, now I see, the, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. He says, now I got to move in this moment. I got to move the very thing that I prayed for. I got a word on it. When you got a word, it's going to recover. Come on. When you got a word, your health's going to get better. When you got a word that something's going to work out, it changes the whole trajectory of things. Because now I don't got to live by the situation. I can live by my revelation, not my situation, which creates reservation. That's good. Why? Because most people are permitting the situations in their life. And if you'll actually hear what God has to say, he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Slap the person next to you, say, he's talking about you. (laughs) Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, stop asking God to do something about it. You do something about it. Oh, this will change your philosophy. If you were raised in church, you're waiting for God to come down and God to act for you. He did 2,000 years ago, and Jesus used the famous word, it is finished. That means your victory was finished. Come on. Your breakthrough over addiction was finished. Your body, your way out of fear, your way out of panic attacks, your way out of a trib, a fib. Come on. It was already accomplished. Oh, this is powerful. Man, if you ever live in the reality of your redemption that it's finished, you ought to look at your bank account and say, it's a finished work. Jesus became poor that I, through his poverty, the scripture says, can have an abundance. That doesn't mean be all super rich and everything. It means having so much that I can enjoy my life and bless other people to have a wealthy life. An abundant life, that bothers people when you talk like this because they go, oh, he's a prosperity gospel. Darn right, if you got problems with prosperity, heaven's not for you. They got streets of gold there. You're going to be highly disappointed. They don't have Nike, they don't have Mikeys, they have Nikes. They don't got Adidas, they don't got the four stripes, they got the three. They don't got the knockoff brand. Come on, coming from Japan. They'll be there in four weeks. I got to get back to my message because I didn't even get started yet. Timothy, in 2 Timothy, it says this. I want to remind you of the faith, the sincere faith. Not unchallenged faith, but sincere faith. That was first in your grandmama, Lois, and in your mama, Eunice. And I'm convinced is in you, Paul's talking to his understudy, Timothy. Therefore, I put you in remembrance, stir up the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of hands. For God has not given you a spirit of fear. Someone say, God's not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. This is powerful. Timothy's dad was not a believer. He was living very, very rich and wealthy in retirement on the golf course somewhere out there. Come on. Use your imagination. He comes from a lineage of faith with his mom and his grandma. And he's thinking about quitting because where he's a pastor in Ephesus, Nero, the political leader, is chopping off Christians' heads. He just put Paul in prison, and he's thinking, you know what? I'm not sure this is cut out for me. His dad's trying to get him to quit and have a more comfortable life. But he knows there's a calling on his life, and he's called to do something big. See, if you'll pay attention, the reason you're in church on a Wednesday night is not just because there's great music, there's great speaking here. There's a call inside you that says, I can't do regular. I can't do ordinary. God puts something in me that I got to live up to. I got to live in the light of eternity because this is not all there is, and I'm responsible for the calling on my life. Just slap the person next to you and say, you have a calling. You have a calling. Oh, that's good. It's a good calling. Come on. I don't have time to go all the way in that tonight, but let me, let me say it this way. He was sitting there. He knows he's called, but he's vacillating in his mind because he doesn't want opposition in his life. You can't help it. Who you are is a target. The enemy hates everything that you're about. You resemble the image of God. So you can sit there and be a punching bag or you can decide to learn how to fight. You'll never outgrow warfare in your life. You must simply learn to fight. 
Why? Because every miracle is surrounded by some type of battle. That means if you're in a battle right now, why? The enemy only attacks what he fears the most. This can help somebody in a minute right here. I'm going to amen myself. Come on, Wednesday night people, miércoles people. The enemy only attacks what he fears the most. Maybe he's trying to get you to say, oh, you're bipolar. You're screwed up in your head. Something's wrong with you. Because he fears that if you ever become secure in the righteousness and what the blood of Jesus has done for you, confidence and strength will emanate out of you. Talent and gifting and ability and love, compassion. Ability will flow out of you. Calling will flow out of you. So he tries to get you to buy into something that ain't true. There's an attack on the mind. There's an attack, every mind's a mind battle. If he can defeat you in your mind, he'll defeat you in your experience. 2 Corinthians 10 says he wants to build a stronghold, an area of thinking where you believe a lie. Wow. Hello. Those holds become the cap, the limit of your potential. You never rise higher than how you see yourself. Your future is in your identity. Woo! Yeah. Your identity is what you fuse to be. If you see yourself as, I'm always going to be big, it doesn't matter how many diets you do, you'll always regain the weight. If you see yourself as an addict, it doesn't matter how many months of sobriety you have, you'll always go back. If you see yourself sick, you'll always attract sickness. It'll be the open door. Don't let the pain of your past and your limiting lives become the haven of demon spirits that want to manipulate you and stop you. Man, this is freaking good. So, man, watch what's going to happen here in the next couple minutes. Timothy's struggling. And he comes, he says, I want to remind you of your spiritual ancestry. You got spiritual DNA through your faith. Sometimes people like to go back and go, who's my grandma? My dad, my grandpa, my, you know what I mean? You got to go back and look at the ancestry.com. And he's telling him, he goes, hey, I want you to remember your spiritual ancestry. If you take like a, you know, like a racehorse, a thoroughbred in the Kentucky Derby, they didn't get there by accident. Those blood sport agents, they went and they studied five, six generations to know their stride, their speed of their grandfathers. There might be 10, 12 generations of champions before they breed them because it'll cost 500,000 to a million dollars to breed that kind of a horse. The breeders know that winning doesn't just happen. Winning is in the power of the blood. Oh, this is going to be good. See, you look at where you came from. You look at what hood you came from. Come on. You look at where you came. We have a history of this. We got a history of that. We got alcoholism in our history. We got ponus in our history. Come on. We got dumbness. We got dyslexic in our family. We got a history of cancer. We got a history of heart disease. People tell you where they come from naturally, but they're not in the natural anymore. The Bible says you don't regard yourself according to the natural. The Bible says that you're a new creation. The power of the blood of Jesus has changed something in your DNA. You got royalty, royalty up in your DNA. Oh, let me just take you down your ancestry. God, your father. Come on. You ain't a bastard. You're a son and a daughter. He wanted you. He's raising you to be a champion. That's why you're in church on a Wednesday night. That's why you had to fight through the depression to get here today. That's why you had to beat the freaking panic attack. Because you're a champion. Your father spoke the world into being. He spoke and it was done. Creating is in your DNA. Oh, this is going to be, Jesus, your older brother, went to hell for you so you never have to go there. He broke out of hell after three days and obtained eternal redemption for you. Overcoming the enemy is in your DNA. Man, if some of you would look in the mirror and go, Jesus is my life. Christ is my life. I'm not my own. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. He lives in me. He pulsates in me. He thinks in me. He loves through me. He gives through me. He prays through me. He works through me. You would start to see yourself on a whole nother dimension. You stop treating yourself as common. 
Acts chapter 10, two different times the Holy Spirit put in the scriptures. What God has cleansed, do not call or label common. Where are in your life because of your background, because of your experience, because of your victim story that we all have one if we want? We can all fight tonight for the victim story. Well, mine is worse than yours. Well, yours is worse than mine. And you know what? Your, your governors, your senators love your victim story because they want you to have a welfare spirit rather than a warfare spirit. They only lead when you don't. They only lead when you don't. You can feel that. You can feel that juice right there. They only lead when you don't. Their, their education only leads when we don't. For our children. Let's not sit back there and curse it. Let's go be light in it. Well, I'm seeing what they're going to do on Twitter. I'm seeing what they're going to do with the new elections. What are they going to throw out? There's a new virus, a new disease. Why do I have to live by their health care plan? Why don't I got to live by their financial plan? I have a scripture that says, I don't got to be conformed. Even though I'm in it, I'm not of this world. Do I believe it or not? Come on. I'm just trying to help you flip the switch. Why? Because when you do, hope's going to come back inside you. It's going to anchor your mind, anchor your will, anchor your emotions. So you're not up one minute, down the next minute. You're not fluctuating between hope and despair. Hope and despair. You're not meteor-minded. Ooh, this is good, huh? I'm going to take you down your spiritual ancestry. Moses, part of the Red Sea. Nehemiah rebuilt walls and rebuilt security in a time where there was not security. Esther rose up as a hero for her people. Heroism's inside of your blood. David knocked out a giant. Conquering giants is in your blood. Daniel slept with lions and he shut their mouths. Protection's in your bloodline. If you would understand in your spiritual DNA what's in your bloodline, you'd stop being not intimidated by what you see in what you feel as long as the enemy can keep you in the realm of your senses you'll be defeated how do you know because I've lived there I know what it's like to be tormented yet gifted I know what it's like to go home and the anointing lift off me you feel you can see a supernatural grace on me I change it came on me in 19, 1997 December 28th I turned the corner for the first time on a stage and I was struggling with my words and all of a sudden something came on me. My eyes became clear. My thoughts became clear. Everything quickened and I opened, put my ear, my hands on a deaf man's ears and they popped open. Something changed in that moment. But I can't live in the gift. I got to be able to learn and live by my faith and not by my senses. Because if you live only when you're in a gifting place, when you go home, you got to live in your senses and the enemy defeats and kicks your butt there. Am I talking to anybody? That's not the Jesus style. The Jesus style is we prosper when the private and in public. We win the private battles. Jesus understands what that's like. That's why he got the word in him so he did not respond to his feelings, but he defeated the enemy with, it is written, it is written, it is written. He didn't say, well, I feel like eating bread. I don't feel like, I, I like to jump off and see God's power from the pinnacle. I'd like to take, no, no, he said, it is written. He didn't cave there. Powerful for a minute. There's so much power in your mouth. The spirit of faith says, I believe, therefore I speak. Many of you, heaven has plans, and I say this prophetically tonight. God wants to invade your world, but angels can't get into your world because of the words you speak. Some of you are, honestly, there's promotions. I say this for you. And there's actually two people you're facing, you're facing like, you're facing going under financially. There's one person, you have a couple businesses in here and you're facing some pretty heavy stuff financially. And God is ready and ready to release angels. But because of what you keep talking about, the angels are held back. Wow. Well, brother, is that, is that spiritual? Is that from the Bible or is that from a book? 
Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 says this. The angel said, I heard your words. I released the angels because of the words you said. <laughs> Demonic and heavenly influence are only have access into your world through your words. You got to win the war of words if you're going to let heaven outweigh the power and the plans of the enemy. Oh, let's go. You want to go a little bit down there? I'll grab a hole for a minute. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, Jesus said, if you barely, barely, I say to you, if you say to this mountain, anybody got a mountain, an obstacle? Be thou removed. Does not doubt in his heart, but believes. Anybody believe still? I know there's not a lot of unbelieving believers these days. They love being Christian. They just don't love any being, being a believer. Maybe you know some. I know so many people that love being a Christian, but they don't have any faith. I know a lot of people like being Christian, but they know nothing about the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit. They know nothing about the gifts of spirit, the works of God. They know nothing about his ways. They got Christian music. They got Christian crosses. They got Christian bumper stickers. They got Christian everything, but they don't know nothing about Jesus or his ways. Come on, smile. Even if you got a couple teeth, try it. Jesus said, Jesus said, the one that you trust for your salvation, the one day, one day you're going to hug him. He's real. One day you're going to walk on streets of gold with him. One day it'll be worth it all. I promise. He said, while well, you're on the earth, if you say to this mountain, be thou removed, do not doubt in your heart, but believe what you say, you will have what you say. Three times he talks about what you say. Only one time he talks about what you believe. Wow. Maybe one belief is what choice and what you say is a constant action. Ooh, this is good. I'm going to help you live with a spirit of faith. It's one thing to say, I believe. It's another thing to get a spirit of faith. I believe, therefore I speak. I believe, therefore I speak. Stop talking about how bad your kid is away from God. My kid will serve the Lord. Begin to declare the word of God. God's word is just as powerful in your mouth as it is in his mouth. Amen. True. Psalm 1989, forever. His word is settled, fixed, established in heaven. Whose words will you establish in your family? Whose words will you establish in your life? God framed his world with his word. You live in his word. Hebrews 1.3 says he upholds and creates by the word of his power, not the power of his word. If it's the power of his word, it's only powerful when God speaks it. But if it's the word of his power, if you wrap a promise in your mouth, there's no devil in hell. There's no death. There's no disease. And if you'll lock your jaws of faith on that thing, like a pit bull, and not let that thing go, you'll get to the other side. Well, I don't really believe that. I'm into the more name it, claim it. I speak it, and it just comes. Sometimes you got to be tenacious and continue to say something. The scripture says, the book of the law, the word shall not depart out of your mouth, but you'll meditate in it. The word meditate means to mutter, speak day and night, day and night. He shall have what he says and he'll prosper in what he does. Right. Paul said to me, don't lose your faith. Stir up the gift of God inside you. Stir up the gift of God. Stir up that fire in you. Stir up that, well, I, well I, got, I got talent for computers. I got a talent for fixed cars. I got to stir that thing up. Well, I already do that. Find a new way to use what you got. Come on, Viagra started out as a heart medication. They found other benefits and they made it something else. <laughs> made a lot more money. Coca-Cola was a headache medication. Tasted really good. They turned it to something else. Why do you got to be one dimensional? You got a talent and ability that God says will continue to make room for you. So it really doesn't matter what's going on in the economy. If you will get skilled, your talent will not fail you. Oh, this is good. Well, I don't got, don't become paralyzed by what you don't have. Jim Thorpe, the famous runner, the day he went to run in the Olympics, someone stole his shoes. He tried to go run the Olympics. He went to a trash can, found two mismatched shoes. One was a woman's shoe, and he put them on his feet. I had a pink one, I think, and a white one. 
and they were mismatched, different sizes, and it hurt his feet. He said, I just had to use what was available to me to maximize my ability with the most that I have. Stop looking at what you don't have. Look at what you do have. Your miracle's not in what you lost, it's what you still got left. Never let the enemy feel like you got to tell you you don't got nothing. Right, yeah. There's always something in your hand that God can multiply right now. I'm helping somebody here for a minute. Come on, you got something. Someone say, I got something. Someone say, I ain't po. Poverty is not a circumstance, it's a mindset. It's a spirit. There's a demon behind it. Why? Because when you po, you're always focused on getting. It's actually greed. Oh, hello. Hello. Proverbs says 22.9, it says, if you've got a generous or abundant vision, you will be blessed or enriched. But if I'm always hasty to get my hands on money, I'm actually being driven by something that on the undercurrent of it is a spirit of poverty that it's never enough. That's why life is not about riches. Riches are what you have. Wealth is who you are. Your value is never determined by your valuables. God determined your value. It's intrinsic. He put it in you in your mother's womb. Regardless of what the government wants you to say, and let me just say this, as a prophetic sign, Roe versus Wade for a minute, it was a sign that in this season, God is overturning many things, and if you'll begin to look for him and begin to declare that God is overturning debt, he's overturning things, God comes in an odd season. Give the Lord a clap and a shout. Come on. Let's go. Come on, you party people. Slap the person next to you say, it's turning. It's turning in your favor. It's turning in your favor. It's turning in your favor. Favor ain't fair, but it turns things. God don't give you a spirit of fear, but of power. Why? Because fear will torment you and prevent you. And it adds up everything you do wrong. It divides, subtracts everything you do right. Multiplies the worry and anxiety in your mind. Dr. Brian, you'll know that. And then it multiplies, it divides your mind. Watch how powerful. He says, I give you a spirit of power, sound mind, and love. Sir, sound mind fast. You got to take control of your mind. Come on. Your mental focus. Why were you focused? You're going to move in that direction. The scripture says, guide your mind. Stop waiting for God to guide it when he told you to do it and he gave you the ability to do it. Proverbs 29, 23, verse 7 and verse 19 as well. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Guide your focus. Let me help you real quick. Choose one word of the kind of person you want to become in the next 90 days. Have one word about character. A good name, character chosen. This is how I measure growth in my life. Not if I'm achieving a certain amount of finance, blessing or anything. Who am I becoming? If I choose one thing and have vision for character, I can incorporate in that my prayer life, my declaration. I want to become, maybe it's more merciful. Maybe it's healthier. Maybe it's kind. When you got a vision, come on. If you don't have something to reach for before you, you're going to die by what's behind you. That's good. That's a tweetable moment. And don't let blind people proofread your vision of what that is. That's a rexism. <laughs> Helen Keller said, what's worse to be more blind? Having sight with no vision. You choose it. You make the vision. The vision makes you. Watch, but then all of a sudden I got to have a spirit of love. Watch. You're affected by its presence and its absence. You're driven to love, from love, to get love. Come on. But love begins with me. What walls are you putting up between you and love? On a personal level, could it be you're just not receiving God's love? Maybe you believe in it, but you don't receive it. My life changed for me when I started saying, God, I receive your love. I receive your love. 1 John 4, 16 says, I've known, I believed and received the love that God has for me. So many of you be so much more mentally, emotionally, physically healed. And let me tell you, faith is easy when you focus on God's love. It's hard when you focus on what you're trying to do. Because faith works by 
What if five times a day you just started walking around wherever you are? God, I receive your love. Your love's restoring my kids. Your love's touching my mind. Your love's giving me strength back. Your love's gonna fulfill the number of my days. Your love's gonna give me favor where other people don't got it. Your love's gonna increase me. Your love's gonna give me creative ideas, creative solutions. Your love's gonna make me a better lover to my spouse. Your lover's gonna, your love's gonna bring the right people into my life, remove the wrong ones. When you become conscious of love, faith becomes automatic. Most people are trying to get faith. And if you focus on how much God loves you, faith becomes easy and insecurity banishes. Now you become the kind of person that can contract and attract an emotionally stable person and you're in a relationship to give love, not to be a fixed or get love. Is this helping anybody in here? Love gives and then it forgives. The only way to measure your relationships is by how much you're giving away. You want to measure the love? How much do you give? But love also forgives. Can I have a couple more minutes tonight? Are you okay with that? I'm like, okay. Are you okay? Yeah. You're going to have to be very, very nice. Some of you have extra money. Tip the people with your kids. Is that cool? Anybody got kids in there? Like more than three? Anybody got three? Anybody got three real quick? Come on. There's a couple 20s. There you go. Just pass them around. Pass them around. Tip the people in there. Here, help me out. You're my man. Come on. If anybody stabs me, you're the one that gets them. So hand those out. Somebody tried to get me not too long ago. The devil don't like it when you break his power in front of people. This isn't a game. Watch how powerful. Love gives and forgives. I take you to South Africa fast. There was a woman there, a white officers was before apartheid. They came to a black, small little area where the black families lived, and they went in, they shot a boy and killed him from blank, right in front of the mom and the dad. And they said all kinds of derogatory comments because of the color of his skin. And the parents did, knew they were powerless to do anything about it because it was all run by white people and a bunch of bigot people. They returned a year later. They, this time they took the man and the wife had no idea. She tried to get a, take a bus to go down and say, you know, these police officers took my husband. There was no sign. They said, we, they just kind of turned a blind eye to it. What they did not know was a year later, they came and got that woman and took him out. The man had lived for a year in some obscure place. There he was tied to a piece of wood. They lit him on fire where he burned to death, where they, the white officers danced around him and they called him all kinds of names for the color of his skin. It was public, public, publicly prosecuted, Officer Vanderbrock. Every one of them was guilty. And this old African, this African woman stood up and they let her say the judgment before they would give the judgment down. She said, what do you want to say? He says, she says, judge, I got three things. Number one, can somebody take me by a court appointment to where my husband's ashes were? He was such a loving, wonderful man. We didn't have a lot to live on, but we had so much that we shared and cared about together. And we had a great life. I want to give him a proper burial for the kind of man he was. Of course, they said. Number two, I, Mr. Vanderbrock, I want to tell you, can you stand up, sir? The judge said, stand up. I want to tell you today that I forgive you because the best part of me, I don't have very flashy gifts. I don't got talents. I don't got a lot of clothes. I don't got money. I live in a pretty dark hut. But one thing I have is God loves me and his love lives in me. And because you've already taken the two people that I had the opportunity to show love to, I want to forgive you and let you off my hook. You're not off God's hook, but I want to let you off my hook because if I don't let you off my hook, then you're going to kill me too. And I don't want the lover in me to stop. You've hurt me. You've wounded me. But the best part of me is a lover. And I'm not going to let the pain you inflicted steal the best part of me. Wow. Finally says, somebody help me over to that man. I don't want him to hear these words. I want him to feel them. Talk sheep. Love someone when they're in addiction. Love somebody else. Love's bigger than death. Love's bigger than bondage. Love's bigger than darkness. It's bigger than cocaine. It's bigger than cancer. It's bigger than diabetes. Love's bigger than it. It's bigger than a diagnosis. It's bigger than bipolar. And we're the most loving people on the planet. Don't love in word, love in action. That means you can't be a watcher of people in pain. Right. 
get involved. Become a, become a Matt Hubbard that wants to go get involved in someone's absolute mess that they made of their life and still put hope in them even while we got to face some hard truth. Fired me up when you did that. Because you don't see that. Most pastors will go hide in a green room. Hello. Don't bother me. This isn't a gig for me. It's a calling. One day I'm going to stand before the master like you are. What did you do? And what did you do with Jesus? Did you accept him or reject him? And number two question he's going to ask you, did you learn how to love? Not how cool was your house. Not how grumpy was your boss. Not how funky was people in your life. Did you learn how to love? They helped this woman across, and she went to hug that man, Officer Vanderbrock, who tortured her kids, her, her, daughter, her husband, and then her son. She hugged him, and he passed out. All of a sudden, these black people that had been completely ostracized because of the color of their skin, evil, grabbed these white people's hands, and they started singing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. All of a sudden, people began to weep and cry, and they started singing this all throughout a courtroom. One woman that was choosing to release love started a revolution in a country. Don't tell me Joe Biden's in control. Don't tell me Donald Trump's in control. Don't tell me Dr. Fauci's in control. Hell no. Don't tell me Gavin Newsom's in control. Don't tell me your little governor down here who thinks he's a big deal, your little thing down here is a big deal. No, no, no. You want to know who's a big deal? A heart and a mind that catches the fire of love and said, I'm going to love people. I'm going to have a standard. I'm going to, I got a spirit of love. And I got a spirit of power. Someone's going to get their power back on. Real quickly, so real quickly, here we go, real quickly. Give me a couple seconds real quickly for this. There's a woman in here, you have a, like a second, a second grader going into second grade or is in second grade, getting ready third grade, but they're having a really tough time learning and you suspect there might be something off in their comprehension and their learning and they're having a tough time. Can you raise your hand? There's someone in here with a second grader, like second grade, seven years old, eight years old. Where, is there someone's hand? Where, where are you? Ma'am, can I pray for you real quick? How old is your child? She's seven, and she's been struggling, and the, the teachers had some concern about her ability to comprehend and be able to, like that kind of a thing, like reading and comprehension. And, I'm sorry. Can I pray for you guys together? Are you, uh, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, can I pray for you guys together? Come down here real quick. You cool? Okay. I can flow here. This is good. This is going to be real cool. Would you stretch your hands to these wonderful people? Hi, how are you? I'm Rex. Great to meet you. How you doing? Great haircut. How you doing? <laughs> He's much better looking. He's got bigger muscles. Don't, don't, don't critique me. Come on. <laughs> we'll stretch your hands to this wonderful family. Lord, what's her name? Lord, I thank you for a creative miracle healing in her brain. I thank you for touching the neurological function of her brain and fusing it. And I think you're going to intervene. And all of a sudden, she's going to say, I get it. I get it. I get it. Mom, I get it. I get it. I'm okay. I get it. I get it. I'm, I'm okay. It's not going to be a struggle. The Lord is intervening even in this hour. The angel of the Lord is being sent to your little girl tonight. And he's going to touch your brain. You're going to come back with a testimony here to this church. Like it's happened for many, many people. And yet God is doing it. Not, not a man. I'm just going to, be a, I'm going to be the mediator. He works through tonight. Why does he use you? Because I'm willing to look stupid. Most people won't take chances. Too scared of what you think about yourself. You're afraid of what would happen if God didn't show up. And you're afraid of if you step up and you don't look good. And most of God's power stays imprisoned in your body. Not because you're less than anybody, but you're just not willing to take enough shots yet because you're not convinced that he really is that good. And he is willing to heal everybody or else he would not have taken their pain. You don't need healing when you get to heaven. You have ultimate health. You have healing on earth. Come on. 
because there's malfunction here. Aren't you glad that Jesus is a healer? If you don't believe he is, go home and cut out all the portions of the Bible that have to do with him healing people. 75% of his ministry was healing people. So therefore, if you don't like that, you probably don't really want to be around him. Thank you, Jesus, for touching her in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you for a supernatural promotion that there's going to be upon your life, but the peace you're going to feel, sir, on your life is going to be crazy. You're going to start really resting well at night. And things are shifting inside of you because purpose is about to really come to fruition in your life where you felt like I'm good at a lot of things. People know me this way, but there's other sides of me I've yet to scratch. And the Lord says, watch as I begin to circulate and percolate new vision on the inside of you for where I'm about to bring you because I'm going to use you to break chains. I'm going to use you to break invisible chains off people. I'm going to use, I'm going to use the frustration you feel to be channeled in a way to break darkness, says the Lord. Even as I raised up a Samson, watch as I raise you up. Your own family will say, man, he's like a different dude. Man, what the heck got in? There's a bold faith in him. There's a a faith that refused. You had a family member, a woman that's prayed for you since you've been a little boy. And God's honored their prayers. That's why he kept you in a fight when you were in high school and another fight in your 20s. The Lord preserved your life for the purpose of your life. The one in the 20s was spent to kill you. And God says, I preserved your life for what I'm about to release through your life for I'm bringing you and your family forward and I'm going to draw out of those wells of compassion out of you both and watch what I do in putting pieces back together and the fractures of relationships I'm mending this night says the Lord give the Lord a clap and a shout I know I'm over I know I'm over sorry nine minutes over (laughs) quickly quickly somebody has pain in their hip you got pain in your hip I can feel it. Sir, in the cheap seats, two of you, both of you. Stay. And my brother, come on, way up there. Come on, I love this. Okay, stay, stay up there real quick. Because I, 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 okay, if, you, if you guys are around them, put your hand on their shoulder. Don't put your hand on their hip. That'll be weird. Okay, put your hand up on my hip. When I... That's not on the Hillsong track. Stretch your hands. Lord, I thank you for healing flowing through their mortal body. Unlock their hips. I pray unlock the tendon and the joint. And your sir, the white, your sciatica. I thank you, the healing present. Watch, you're going to feel a warmth go down the left-hand side. One, two, three. Boom, go through him right now. You're going to feel a warmth go all the way down that side, even the lower part of your leg. And thank you, Lord, for freeing all of these men, freeing them from being healing in their hips. In the name of Jesus, move your hips now. Start looking for healing. Look for healing. Don't look for pain. Move around. Pretend like you're at Pilates. Come on. I know most women do Pilates, but let's just try it. <laughs> How does that feel? Is there a difference? What? What's the difference? Less pain? Move it around. Run down here real quick. Just you, like that's the price is right. Run down real fast. I got to go fast because there's people here. Shannon, how are you? I see you. You're stepping into a new thing. Watch what happens around October the 13th. There's going to be a client that's going to come to you between the 13th and the 15th of October. And watch what that's going to open up. It's going to be in the LA region around Lost Hills, around Calabasas area. But there's an opportunity that's coming that the Lord's sending your way. And the Lord says you're going to be very, very friendly, but don't be too close because I'm going to protect you in this matter for things you do not know. But it's going to be a financially rich blessing and opportunity for you. Once again, I say to you. Be very, very kind and friendly, but don't get too close. Don't share your heart. I'm going to protect you in this matter, says the Lord. Oh, come on. This is cool. Come on. I like you, man. You're freaking firing me up. Come on. Watch how cool this is. Oh my gosh. What if it doesn't work? What if it does? What if it does? You're just a good guy. And you know what? Jesus is always willing. So the pressure's on him. I don't got to say the right prayer. I don't got to do, I can just love him. Does that make sense? If I have to think about it, I have to say all the right prayer, all the focus is on me. And sometimes my prayers aren't the best. Are you the only one? I come, I'm the only one that thinks that way? I'm like, oh man, I should have said like that guy did. You know what I mean? Come on, little faith, big God. Jesus, I thank you for your healing presence flowing through his mortal body. 
You're gonna feel that go through you, boom. <laughs> flow through his mortal body, flow through his sciatica, flow through his leg and his hip, unlock that thing completely. I thank you, Master Jesus, for bringing healing to him in your powerful name. And watch too, like some of the anxiousness is gonna stop too. That's been pretty strong for the last two and a half to three months where it comes like little anxiousness. Do you feel that at times? Yeah. Watch how cool. It's not gonna be like a PTSD. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus, for bringing healing. Move your hip. What just happened? There's less pain, is it noticeable? Bend down, touch your toes. Move it around, ooh, what just happened? What just happened? Now there's less pain, watch, this is good. We keep going, watch, stay with me. You can't, you couldn't live in my house and not get healed, it's impossible. Why are you better? No, I just don't allow it to stay around. It may come, but it ain't coming to stay. It's coming to pass. Come on, this is really good. Somebody in here too, uh, there's a woman, um, you're, you're, you're being touched in your, in your female organs um, and you're, there's cells that are bad. There's cells that are bad and it's causing you to have panic attacks and it's nothing where you feel pain and anxiety. Is that you, ma'am? What's that? Stand up for a second. Those around her, just put your hand on her. I can just feel this flowing through. This is really cool. You stay with me here. Jesus, thank you for your healing presence flowing through her mortal body, restoring her unto health and freeing her. I thank you, Father, freeing her in Jesus' name. You're gonna feel like a warmth go through your mortal body. Jesus is touching you tonight. You're so, I love your faith. You're so easy to get healed. In Jesus' name. What just happened? What just happened? Talk real loud. The kidney pain, move it around, move your whole body. Watch how good you feel. It just went out of your leg. That's a good testimony, keep going. That's a noticeable difference, huh? Oh my goodness, is that what you said? What just happened right there? What's that? Two weeks of being on antibiotics has done anything, and that cool lady next to you with the cool hair, she prayed for you, and then you got healed at Waken Church. Is that what happened? Why don't we give the Lord a clap and a shout? Move your back. Watch how cool that is. We want to say this too. Somebody here, you've been labeled, and a doctor told you, I, this is coming to me, that you were bipolar. And that there's no stigma here. So listen, everyone deals with stuff. But someone has told you, you, sir, he told you, can I tell you something? And I don't want to minimize any medical physician whatsoever, but it's not true. Yeah. And I'm not saying that to put any doubt in you, suspicion, but God's going to reverse all the effects of stuff that you've experiencing. You don't have a damaged mind. You're getting a healed mind. Can you run down here? Can you run down here fast? Move your back, watch how good that feels. Do you feel like it's going to your body? Stretch it out, yeah. That's cool. What's your name, sir? Jonathan, thank you for having courage. We celebrate that, man. Come on, man. So, hey, would you stretch your hands to this world shaker for a minute? Why, because we care. What if it's your prayer that makes the difference? You, if Jesus could do it, you could do it. He said so. Lord, I thank you for a creative miracle healing. A creative miracle healing in his brain and his mind. I feel that going out to a lot of people. Right now, if you just have, you're struggling where you're having episodes in your brain or your mind where you feel like it's really brain foggy and you feel like you're in and out and you're struggling, just put your hand on your head real quick. Lord, I pray a creative miracle healing anointing right now. I break the power of that over people's minds. I break that tormenting spirit and I command it to go out of people right now. I command that thing to go. I command that thing to go. And Lord, I thank you for restructuring, restructuring the neurological function, fusing the neurons, opening blood vessels. You're going to feel that, sir, right there. 
Open that blood vessel. Open those blood vessels. And I thank you for a supernatural cooling and peace that's going to come over people's brains right now. I thank you that panic attacks and depression tonight, it lifts off people tonight in the authority of Jesus' name. Amen. What do you feel going through you? A whole lot of, not a lot of bad things. <laughs> and you know what? God's going to use your creativity. God's going to use your ingenuity and your creativity to see things. You're going to get around a lot of people that don't support an issue, but support you and your identity as a God's kid. You're a world shaker. And the enemy tried to isolate you. He always tries to divide to conquer. He always tries to divide to conquer. Don't stop forsaking together. We need each other. Come on. Don't hang out with pigeons. They'll crap on your dreams. Don't hang out with vultures. They'll feed on your trash. Don't hang out with chickens. They'll flap but not fly. Get around some eagles that can see. Get around some people that expand their wings. Get around some world shakers that pray. Get around some people that speak faith and speak miracles. Get around other people that believe God for the impossible. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Did you feel that peace go through the back of your head? Yeah, it felt weird. It felt really weird, but uh, I'm here for it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> Thank you for coming. So here's what we're going to do because we have kids. We got to do help kids. I'll stay for a little bit over here. I won't stay forever tonight. I prayed for a lot of people in the last couple of days. But what I'm going to do is I'll stay and pray for some people that need help tonight. If you need help, sir, you real quickly, and you just put your hand out with the hat. What do you need? What a, what a cool, thank God you're hungry. I honor that about you. How many people in here just say, I want to take my faith to the next level? Second Thessalonians says a growing, exceeding faith. Anybody want like a growing, exceeding faith? You don't want your faith to plateau, come on. I love that, you're gonna stir up a lot of people right now. Put your hand on your heart. Say, Jesus, I thank you that I have the faith of God in me. It's growing, because I'm hearing your words. It's gonna become mighty, because I'm gonna speak your words. And mountains in my life, they will obey me, because you said so. My faith is bigger than any challenge. My faith is not based on feelings. My faith is based on the Word of God. Jesus, you are my faith. My focus is on you and how much you love me and that your love is restoring my soul, is healing my body, is meeting all of my needs, and is blessing my family and using me and using me to change my city. Say it like you got juice, to change my city. I have a spirit of power. I have a spirit of love. And I have a spirit of a sound mind. I'm coming out of this. I'm changing, I'm healing, I'm growing. And I will become all God said. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that will rise against me, I condemn it. Because I am the righteousness of God. I am forgiven. I am healed. I am blessed. I am anointed. And I go in strength. From here on out, no looking back. I set my face before me, and I will finish my course. Goodness is coming my way this week in Jesus' name. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap and a shout. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen. For more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. 
We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.